Hey, what's up guys? This is Matthew Doyle. I hope you guys that are watching have been able to stick with me and uh, we're starting a new year here and I wanted to start this new year out with an introduction to Lua inside of Stingray. Uh, Stingray is the new game engine that Autodesk is putting out and it uses Lua to do gameplay scripting. So what I want to do today is basically explain why Stingray uses Lua, what kind of language St uh, Lua is, and I'm even going to show you some hands-on tutorials on how to use Lua with Stingray's visual scripting tool Flow, so how you can talk back and forth between those two, as well as uh, how to use Stingray to talk to a C++ DLL that you might create for doing things inside of C or C++ that are going to be done a lot faster than they would be done in Lua. There's not a lot you're going to want to do in C++. A lot of your gameplay logic is going to be fine in Lua, but if there's anything really performant, anything you really need that's, that's, that's thrashing away, that's going to be running many cycles throughout your game loop, uh, having to be run a lot, then you're probably going to want to do that in C++ or C. And the great thing is, is you can communicate with C, a DLL, with uh, Lua inside of Stingray. And I'll talk to you about that, how, do you, how you do that inside of Lua a little bit later. Uh, first thing to bear in mind, Stingray uses a special version of Lua called Lua JIT. And JIT stands for Just-in-Time Compiler. It's actually a faster version of Lua that allows the code to be compiled. The virtual machine of Lua compiles the code into C code at runtime, making the Lua execution. Uh, I've heard approaching speeds that even uh, get up to almost what C++ might actually uh, be able to achieve. So I'll talk to you more about LuaJIT later on uh, in the tutorial, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with talking about Lua itself. Now uh, we're going to go ahead and jump over to my Stingray here. And so what is Lua? So, well, Lua is a scripting language. It's not it's not like C++ or C, so you don't have to worry about memory management because Lua is a managed programming language. That means that basically uh, all of that memory handling and stuff is going to be done for you by the Lua virtual machine. So you don't have to worry about that. Lua uses what's called a garbage collector to handle clearing memory when it's not in use. And uh, on top of that, Lua is very fast. It's a very lightweight and portable language. It's very easy to learn. I mean, I picked it up in just a couple of days. Now, bear in mind that I've been doing scripting and stuff in a lot of other languages for, for several years. Um, so I had kind of a, a running start on how to do scripting. But Lua itself is so easy to pick up. Uh, very human-readable language. Now, bear in mind that Lua is a dynamically typed scripting language. That means that any variable that you create is going to be able to hold any kind of data you don't type the variables. In other words, you don't create such as a Boolean variable and, and that variable can only hold Boolean values or a string variable and that variable can only hold strings. Any variable you create can hold any type of data. Now this can be a problem when you're talking to C++ uh, because obviously in C++ or C you do have this, uh, what's called a statically typed language, meaning that all your variables are, are locked to the type that they're set to. And so that can create some, some issues there. But uh, to make up for that, Lua basically uses a special uh, stack of memory that it allows that it shares with your C and C++ code. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into that part of the tutorial. Uh, and again, remember Lua is a managed language. That means it uses a garbage collector for memory. C and C++ do not. So again, uh, you know, obviously you might have some issues there if you're talking to a C++ DLL managing the memory. Uh, C does not know when you're clearing things with the garbage collector. It has no connection to the Lua garbage collector. And that's again why uh, Lua uses a static, uh, or not a static, but a stack uh, of memory basically that it shares with your C and C++ code. Uh, so um, let me jump back over to my, my full screen here for a second. I'm going to show you a very good resource that you're going to want to pick up if you can. Uh, I know it's the digital age and you could get these books digitally on your iPad or whatever. Uh, I prefer to read books in print still. I don't know why. Call me old fashioned. But this book here is called Programming in Lua and it is basically the official Lua book for learning the Lua language, written by the original Lua developer. Uh, I don't know if I can say his name properly, but Roberto is his first name. And anyway, this is third edition. It covers Lua 5.1, um, 5.14 or up to 5.15. I can't remember exactly which. But bear in mind, Lua changes frequently. Uh, and uh, every change that Lua goes through is a big change. They make a lot of changes to how Lua works. So you, you want to stick with the, the version that is, um, 
uh, you know, get books and stuff that relate to the version that you'll be using because the next versions may change very significant portions of how Lua works. And obviously you're going to run into some issues there if, if that's the case. Now, to find out what version of Lua Stingray is using, it's uh, pretty easy. If we go down to the bottom here, there's a, a drop down here where it says Command. You can change that to Lua. And then we'll just type, um, see if I can remember the statement, print. And then in parentheses, we're going to do underscore all caps version and close that out. And if we go over to the log console here, we should see our Lua version right here at the bottom, 5.1. Uh, that's not super specific. It doesn't tell us the subversion, whether it's .2, .3, or .4. Uh, I think that we're using 5.1. Uh, that's possible that it means it's using the actual uh, 5.1.0 version of Lua. Uh, and, but the thing is, is bear in mind, again, we're using a special version of Lua called Lua JIT. And I'm going to show you where to go to get Lua JIT, the exact version that is currently recommended in Stingray a little bit later. But um, bear in mind that as Stingray gets updated, as new versions come out, there's a good chance that they will update the Lua VM to uh, more recent versions of that. Um, but for now, I am using Stingray version 1.1, and in Stingray.1.1, this is the version of Lua that we're using. All right, so um, if you want to get help on the Lua API in Stingray, it's very easy. Just go to Help, Documentation, and we'll go ahead and bring that up. And right here, you can see Lua API Reference. We'll just click on that. And here we have the full uh, help for Lua inside of Stingray. You can browse by namespace, and that's just going to give you currently the two categories are Scaleform and Stingray, because Scaleform Studio, which is the UI tool in Stingray, uses Lua as well. Uh, we can also browse by category, so we have things that affect AI, the core Lua, uh, entities, math, networking, physics, on and on and on. Uh, obviously, you can do a search. So I could do a search maybe for human IK. And there we go. We've got all the Lua associated with human IK inside of Stingray. Um, all right, so fully complete API docs here just from the Stingray help. Uh, all right, so we've looked at the API docs. We've looked at uh, the version of Lua. Let's talk a little bit about the settings uh, INI file inside of Stingray, how it applies to your Lua code. So I have a Stingray project here that I've created, and this project was created based on the simple uh, empty project inside of Stingray. And if we go up into the very first folder here in the asset browser, you're going to find these two files here, boot package and settings INI. Now boot package basically is a file, uh, if we go ahead and open it real quick, it basically specifies all the different directories and therefore all of the files within those directories that we want Stingray to load when we load our game. So you can see here we have our config file, we have fonts, we have the levels that we want loaded into the um, uh, application, we've got the Lua code directories, so forth and so on. Uh, but what I want to look at here is settings.ini. So by the way, I'm using the Stingray script editor window here uh, normally it is a free floating window. I like to dock it up here with the level viewport and several other windows. Okay, so here's script uh, settings.ini. And what settings.ini does is it allows you to specify what your first Lua file will be that um, basically that your application loads when it launches your game or application, right? So here we see boot script equals, and this is pointing to a relative path to our first file. So in this case, it's pointing to core app kit Lua main. And here, of course, is boot package, specifying that that file boot package, we could name this anything. I could call it my boot package or whatever, and then I would just need to change my boot, uh, boot here to my boot. Uh, but again, back to this, this is the directory we need to look in. Now, this is going to be found inside the Stingray install on your computer. So if we go over to Windows Explorer, and in Stingray 64 bits, so we're going to go under Program Files, Autodesk, Stingray, and the version I'm using here, 11235. All right, and then uh, if we go into the core directory, AppKit. So if I move this window over here, we can see that's our directory, AppKit, Lua, 
All right, so here are several files. These are Lua files that ship with Stingray that uh, are kind of just pre-built application files that will allow you uh, as a developer to basically have kind of a shortcut to building your games. So you don't have to write all of this stuff from scratch. We've already done a lot of work for you. And uh, that includes for simple projects, we have our main, as it says here, our boot script main, main.lua file. And if I just open that up real quick inside something like Sublime Text, you can see here, um, this is the core of our application. So this is main.lua. This is what's going to be loaded whenever our game starts. All right, and so without going into too much detail here, uh, we'll just talk about some of this stuff here. So we have things like init, shutdown, update, and render. These are all going to be handled by our custom project file. We're going to create a custom uh, Lua file for our project that kind of mirrors this one. And it's going to very, be very specific about how it handles things like init, shutdown, update, and render. All right, um, okay. So the other thing I wanted to point out inside of this directory here is again, these are all classes and stuff that have been built ahead of time for you to use in your game. Now, when I say classes, I should probably be a little more specific because Lua does not have a built-in class implementation. You can use Lua as an object-oriented programming language, but it does not have built-in classes or built-in privacy. You have to kind of create your own versions. Now, rather than having you making you create your own class implementation, we've already got one in here uh, from the Stingray developers. So if we launch this class.lua file, uh, we can see here this is basically an object-oriented class created, set up for multiple inheritance uh, and being able to call from its parent or its super, I should say, uh, if it inherits from another class. And so all this is done ahead of time for you. And I'm actually going to give you a tutorial on how to use this class implementation to create a custom class inside your game. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little while. Um, okay, so there's a lot of other stuff in here. I mean, you've got things like uh, world, uh, world and level wrappers. Uh, we've got some utils. I can load this up here. You can see uh, this util asks, is this, it'll ask, are we running on PC? Should we use touch-based interfaces? Uh, you know, what kind of platform are we on? This tells you if it's an Xbox, a PS4, or whatever, uh, and so forth. So lots of good utility classes in here, things that you'll want to use. And uh, but overall, uh, the most important ones we're going to be talking about today, or the most important ones, yes, are class and uh, main.lua. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump back over to uh, our Stingray project here, and we can close down this. Now, if you wanted to change this, by the way, you could. You could change your boot script from that. If you did not want to use any of the pre-built Lua script, that the Stingray development team has put in there. You could change this directory, and, and I could change it to say script Lua. So I could say, let's just write down right here. I could put boot underscore script equals script slash Lua slash my project file or whatever, you know, and that would, and then, you know, if I comment this guy out here or delete it uh, entirely, uh, that will use that file as the boot up Lua script instead of the one inside the Stingray project or Stingray program files core directory. All right, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but bear in mind, if you do that, you're going to have to build all that stuff yourself. You're going to have to build all that stuff from scratch. Uh, and so it's kind of good to just start with what what's already there for you. It's a good skeletal framework to get started with, at least if you're just getting into developing with Stingray and Lua. All right, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start out by creating uh, our first project file. Or, and um, what we're really going to do is just modify the, the pre-built project file that comes with the empty project when you create it. And that's going to be found under your script Lua folder. So in here, we're going to find three files. We've got flow callbacks. Uh, and actually, this file is not one that you're going to see. So you're only going to see two files. I can delete that. That was just a custom file I created earlier that I don't need. All right, so you're going to find these two files, flow callbacks and project. And flow callbacks, I'll talk to you a little bit later about because that has to do with creating custom flow nodes using Lua. And I am going to explain how you can do that pretty easily. Uh, but here's the file we want, project.lua. And this is the pre-built project.lua file that when you create an empty project, this is what it's going to give you. So we can see here, uh, I'm not going to teach you 
uh, Lua per se today, so I'm not going to explain some of these things such as, you know, here it says project equals project or uh, open and close brackets here. What this is saying is uh, we're project, this is our, our main project file, This it's creating itself. Uh, now if it already exists, it's going to use a different version of it uh, that's already already in existence. So this is basically just testing whether or not project already exists, because if it does you don't want to recreate it. Uh, and if not, it's going to create a new version of project, which is a table. So everything in Lua is a table. All variables, all functions, uh, everything in Lua is what's called a table. That is the core data type of Lua. All right, but like I said, I'm not going to teach you everything there is to know about Lua. That's where you need to go on the in internet, and there's lots of great sites like Lua.org to learn. Or, you know, again, that book I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, uh, pick up a copy of that on Amazon or something like that. Uh, but I will explain some things that are important to our presentation today. All right, so uh, we can see here we're, we're basically, we have one level that we're setting for our project. It's called uh, Content Levels Empty, but today I'm going to create a new one, and we're going to basically call this one Intro to Lua. So Intro to Lua equals content slash levels slash intro to Lua. All right, and we'll just save that. So if I go back over to Content Levels, here's my Intro to Lua file. We'll just make sure that that is loaded into our viewport. All right, and down here where it says simpleproject.config, it has standalone init level name. We're going to change this project.levelnames.empty, referring to this guy right here in this table. We're going to change that to intro to Lua. All right, and that should be the level that we load right off of the bat. All right, let me go to my notes here so we can make sure I'm uh, on the right track. If I can find my notes. <laughs> All right. There they are. Okay, um, so let's continue from there. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create our, our first custom class. And this custom class is going to, again, make use of that pre built class implementation inside of Stingray. Uh, and we're going to do it basically when we load our level. So um, when the level gets loaded, intro to Lua, we've got several functions here as part of our main project. We've got on level load preflow, then we've got on level shutdown postflow, we've got update, render, and shutdown. So these functions are all going to be called automatically by the Lua virtual machine as your game is executing. Um, and I guess, let's see, this call from flow I can delete because that is not normally in there. That was from uh, one of my custom functions. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But all right, so let's go ahead and start with creating our, our custom class and show you how you would call that custom class uh, inside of Stingray. So let's, um, let's see here. Let's go ahead and create a new script file. And we'll go ahead and close settings.ini and boot package. We'll leave Project Lua open for now. And right here in the script editor, we'll just hit this top left button to create our new script. And this is how we're going to do this. So basically, we're going to, we have to first basically create the class itself. So we're just going to call this my class equals. And we're going to point to the app kit. Okay, that was that folder inside of the Stingray program files directory, the app kit folder dot class. All right, and that is that class file, that Lua file, the implementation for creating a class. And we're going to reference again this new class we're creating, my class. So we're basically telling the Lua VM to use that class implementation that's in the app kit to create our custom class called my class. Now inside of here, we're going to create several functions. Now Lua uses what's called chunks. So every every block of code, every file, every Lua file is considered a chunk. So this is going to be considered a single Lua chunk. Now, if you were running just the standalone Lua interpreter and doing lines, uh, typing in lines to that interpreter one line at a time, each line is considered a chunk. So it's basically a chunk is a group of code that gets executed sequentially. All right, so this is our first Lua chunk, and this is our custom class. We're going to create a function here, and we're going to call this function my class colon and what we're doing here with the colon is we're using uh, basically object-oriented programming, which we're telling the function to have a reference of itself. Otherwise, we could use dot, and then we can type in it. Now, if we do the dot, 
we are not using we're not telling the function to use itself as a reference and in this case I want to do that so I'm going to use colon in it all right and there's my open and close parentheses that starts my function and in here I'm just gonna basically real simple stuff here I'm not gonna do anything really fancy today because it's supposed to be an intro all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the Lua print command I'm gonna say uh, my class and then the word in it all right and then we gotta close every function out with the, the word end that's the keyword there all right so let's do a couple more functions here in our class we'll do another one my class colon foo let's do capital F not food foo and we'll expect a message remember I don't have to specify a variable type here because every variable is dynamically typed in Lua so this variable could be anything it could be a boolean it could be a number could be a string uh, in this case we're expecting a string or I guess a number would work as well it could be even a table uh, all right we're gonna type uh, my class and foo equals now dot dot is a concatenation for a string so we if we're expecting a string use a dot dot here and then we'll type the variable uh, message here now if it's not a string when it comes in it might give you an error because it won't be able to concatenate something that isn't a string with a string in that case you can instead of in, instead of concatenating you can just put a comma and then type message and in this case it's basically gonna do a tab and put your print out the, the message it's not gonna actually concatenate it with my class foo equals all right and we'll end that function as well next up we'll do function my class colon bar and this time we're gonna take two values value one and value two and we're just gonna print these guys out as well so my class and then we'll do dot dot we're gonna concatenate this time value one dot dot plus concatenating the two values so we're gonna add the two values basically value two and then dot dot equals and bear in mind that the strings here are they're not actually doing the the mathematics they're just gonna be printed out the plus and equal signs there dot dot and here's where we'll do the math value one plus value two that easy all right all right so that is gonna be our first class our custom class here and we're gonna save it so we've got our intro to Lua we're gonna save it under script Lua and we'll just call this my first class okay uh, all right so now let's actually create the class and uh, run some of the functions so inside of our on level pre flow function here so this is uh, this is when the level has loaded but before it is executed any of the flow the visual scripting inside of stingray uh, okay so what we need to do is we need to create an object so in object oriented programming if you're not familiar with it and if you aren't you probably should get familiar with it you create objects and these objects inherit from the classes so the class is kind of like a blueprint or a template uh, not to confuse the templating of C and C++ but yes like a blueprint and then the blueprint is used to create the actual object and you can create many objects based on that blueprint so we're gonna create our object here we're gonna first of all specify this as a local variable meaning it's only gonna be alive throughout this function once we leave this function on level load pre flow this will no longer exist we're gonna call it my object and we'll say equals my class all right and that should be enough to instantiate or create the class as an object I should say and then we can actually use my object to execute some of the functions inside of it so we'll do my object foo and let's type excelsior get this out of the way for those of you that are into Marvel comics you'll be familiar with that term uh, and then we'll do my object bar and we'll do three and eight how about that I don't know why I chose those numbers but there you go uh, alright so let's just save that and um, we'll go ahead and run our code here just make sure we're still streaming here and I don't have any comments sorry guys if you're commenting over there on the side it's just uh, it's really hard for me to keep track of comments while I'm writing code alright so let's go ahead and play the level and a log console is up here 
Uh, oops, and looks like we've got some typos inside of our code, no problem. We'll just have to fix those. So let's jump over to, looks like line 12 in Project Lua. We don't have a close bracket, so we'll jump back over to our script editor and see what we're missing here. Ah, I see what happened. So when I added the intro to Lua here, uh, I forgot to put a comma. So this is a comma separated or comma delimited list uh, inside of this table. So always bear that in mind. All right, let's try again. So we'll hit play. And we just gotta give Stingray a few seconds here to launch the level, everything seems good. But we've got uh, another error here. So, all right, so attempt to call, cl let's see, global my class a nil value. Okay, so we need to double check our code here. We've got a little bit of an error here on our class. Let's jump over to the class file. Make sure I saved it in the right place. My first class, yep. Uh, all right, so my class equals class. Mm-hmm, that's all good. You know, I don't see any issues with the actual class code, so let's jump back over to my project. All right, so, oh, I see. All right, so here is where, what's happening is, so uh, let me close down this editor window first, and what's happening here is Lua cannot actually find my class. That's what that error is. That's why we got a nil value. So a nil value in Lua basically is telling you that it did not get whatever it was you were trying to get. Uh, it burnt, returned nil, nothing, it doesn't exist. And the reason why my class doesn't exist is because we did not tell it, uh, tell our project file where to find my class. So we need to basically require it. So we use the keyword in Lua require, and we're gonna tell it to require script slash Lua slash my first class. There we go, and we'll save it. And we'll try playing it again. Jump over to log console. All right, so it seems to have worked that time. There we go. So if you look at the very bottom of the log console, here is my class, the print functions that I specified. First of all, init fires just because my class was created. That's the init function. That automatically fires. Then we called the foo function, and it prints out the word Excelsior, and we called bar, which prints out the uh, addition, the deaddition result of 3 plus 8. So there you go. So that's, that's it. I mean, it is that easy to create a class in Lua. Um, you know, it's, again, because the developers have already created a class implementation for you guys inside of the core uh, app kit location of the Stingray install. So if you just follow that format to create your own classes, um, obviously you're going to want your classes to do something more interesting than that. You might attach a class to a, a unit in your game maybe an enemy unit or, or even the player unit or you know pretty much everything in your game is probably going to be built of classes if you follow object-oriented programming. Uh, and then that unit could, that class could tell that unit how to get around the world, what happens when it gets hit, how much health it has, all that kind of stuff can be part of your unit class. Uh, all right, so let's move on to, now that we know how to build classes in Lua and how to solve some common error problems, Let's look at how to communicate between Lua and Flow and Flow and Lua to go back and forth. So first up, let's look at custom flow nodes inside of Lua just, just briefly here. Now, if we go to the level flow here and I right click, these are all the flow nodes that we can add and these all ship with Stingray. These are pre-built flow nodes. Uh, but if you look here in this project category, we've got a flow node here called example print. Now this is a custom flow node built with Lua. And you can add as many custom flow nodes on a project basis. You can add them to your project to show up in this project category here. Uh, and uh, technically you could create cust other custom categories as well. And the way that works is if we jump into the script folder here, you're going to find this global file. So let's go ahead and open that. So inside the global file here, we can see in a JSON format, we've got the word nodes equals, and then we've got our brackets. And inside of these nested brackets, this is the actual custom flow node that you will see in the level flow editor. This does not contain the code, just the, the actual node itself, what it's called, 
what kind of arguments it expects, and then it points to the function. So here's what it's called. These are the arguments it expects. You can also put return values here if, it ex if it's going to spit something out. Uh, and of course, you can comma separate a, and create a list of multiple values. Then our function, it's telling us our function can be found in the file project flow callbacks, and it's called example. Here's our category, project. We could obviously change this to something else, my project, uh, the name of your game project, whatever you want to do, the name of your company. And then we jump over to our Lua folder, and we'll find the flow callbacks file there. Bring that up. And inside of flow callbacks, you can see here, once again, project flow callbacks, first of all, needs to create itself uh, if it doesn't already exist. And inside of here, it's kind of just like the class that we defined. You see here, we defined a class in the same way. We also defined our project in a similar way. Uh, and there we go. So we're creating this, and we're and this is part of the project flow callbacks chunk of code. And here is our example. So project flow callbacks dot example. In this case, we're not passing self, so we don't use the colon. And t is the value, the argument that we're going to get in. So if we look over here under args. We have text equals string. Text will be what it's called in the flow node. And string is, is the type of value we're expecting. You could change this to number, uh, which is a Lua value, or uh, any other value that's possible here, such as Boolean. OK. We're just going to leave that string, however. And then what it does is uh, it basically creates a message based on that argument, so t.text, and then prints it out. Very simple, nothing, nothing special here as well. So if we right click and go to um, project and then example print, here's our custom flow node. There's the text property that's expecting a string value in. And then we could, you know, obviously give it a string variable here or something else that we could, whatever, however, we could also just give it the actual raw data. And in this case, we could, you know, obviously go out from here to do something else, but if we wanted to add a return value, we, we'd have to do that inside the actual custom flow node. And uh, yeah, so that's it. I mean, that's, first of all, the easiest way to do flow in Lua is to create custom flow nodes uh, using Lua. Uh, now let's talk about how to actually um, talk to Lua from flow. So inside of... Um, Lua, let's say that we have a, a special function that we want to be able to call from flow. So let's go ahead and go to our project file here. And let's see, let's put it, let's go ahead and go down past all of these important functions here. And let's just put our function right here. So we're going to call it function and we'll call this project dot call from flow. And we'll just put in here my flow var. And um, what we want this function to do, it's going to be very simple, is uh, in this case, we're just going to say print. Uh, for now, I was called from flow. And let's see. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and also we'll output the, um, the variable. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to basically going to create a custom flow node that um, we can set a value or a variable with, and then we can output that variable. To, we can send it back over to Lua. We can send it back to Flow and make changes to it, uh, and then we'll just print that out. So first up, we need to um, set the value of a Flow variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to show how you can set a value um, of a Lua variable. Um, and then we'll do, so let's go ahead and just put a comment here so we know what we're doing. We're going to set the value of a flow variable. All right, and then we'll do another thing where we get the value of a flow variable. Okay, uh, and then finally we will print that value. So let's just do a comment for now. Print the value. All right, and it will end our function right there. Okay, so before we actually create the Lua code here to do these things, let's jump back over to our level flow and let's talk about some of the Lua scripting nodes that are available here. So if you right click and go to script, you're going to find two nodes here. We have script call global and script do string. So let's just look briefly at script do, do string. Now, do string is just going to execute a custom Lua script right here on the fly 
that whatever it is that you type into the script field. Uh, so let's go ahead and oops, I got two windows up here. Let's just type something simple. Print hello world. All right. And so let's just verify my script is still there. Should probably close my level down. Let's try that again. Print hello world. There we go. Uh, and we're going to do this on level start, level load. So we'll just tie this to uh, event and level loaded. All right. So this is a very, very simple way of calling Lua. But however, this is not calling Lua in your Lua code. This is a custom block of code that you type in here. So we'll save the file and we'll execute the editor and um, put my log console back there. If we scroll down to the bottom, we should see hello world here. There it is. All right, so there you go. Hello world. So very, very simple. Again, this is great for just something quick that you want to put Lua in, but you don't. it's not tied to any of your actual Lua code. Uh, however, if you want to do something that's actually in your Lua code, you're going to use a different function. So back over to the script folder here, we have script call global. Now script call global is going to allow us to actually call functions in our Lua code, in our project's Lua code. So we'll go ahead and we'll, once again, I guess we'll just tie this to level loaded and we'll give it a function name from our Lua code. If you recall, that was project.callFromFlow. Okay, um, now in this case, we currently don't have any expectations. We're just gonna print out that I was called from Flow. So we'll go ahead and just save that as is. And we'll give it another shot here. Make sure it works. All right, let's scroll down and we should find I was called from flow here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. So I was called from flow right here. So that's uh, how you call a custom Lua function in your Lua code from flow. But let's go a little bit further and let's talk about doing some more unique things with flow and Lua, such as triggering events. We can actually trigger events in the level. We can also, again, set variables and get variables from flow and, and back and forth with Lua. So let's start out by triggering an event. Um, so let's let's create an event in our level here. Let me let me find my little sheet here, my little cheat sheet, what I want to create. Uh, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a real simple event. We're just going to basically print to the screen. So we'll go to debug and print to screen. And we're going to basically say the word boom. How about that? So we'll type into the text here the word boom. So we can just pretend that this is an explosion or something that occurs in our game. Uh, any, any kind of event that you can imagine, basically. Uh, and from here, we're going to go to our in property. We need to specify that event as an external event. All right. So in this case, we're basically coming in to the level externally from somewhere else. And in this case, the Lua code. So we'll do external in event. And we'll call that event explosion. So we'll just do all lowercase explosion. All right, so there's our custom event. Now we need to go over to the Lua code and create that custom event. All right, so what we're going to do here is, in this case, we're going to do this uh, on level loaded. So we're going to jump down below our class here in the on level load preflow function of project. And we're going to first of all need to basically get a reference to our level. Um, now, uh, to do that, before we get started, well, let's go ahead and just write the way we get our reference here. We're going to call this level equals. We're going to create a variable level equals. And we're going to reference simple project. Simple project is kind of the parent of um, our project file here inside of the app kit. So simple project dot level which should contain a reference to the currently loaded level. All right, now in order to properly use that, we're going to come up here to the top and we're going to define a couple of local variables here. We're going to define local uh, level as simple project dot level or nil if it doesn't exist. Uh, and we might as well go ahead and specify the level name. So I, I don't think we'll use it, but we'll go ahead and just get it, a reference to it. So level name equals simple project 
dot level underscore name or nil. All right, so that should initialize our variables with the data in that is stored inside of Simple Project. Uh, and if not, obviously we'll get nil values. Um, okay, now Simple Project already does all the work of getting this information. That's why we're grabbing it from Simple Project. Okay, so back down here. <clears throat> uh, let's see, where were we? Where were we? Okay, so now we have a reference to our level. We're going to go ahead and fire our event. It's very simple. We're just going to use stingray dot. That's the namespace. So remember from the Lua APIs, we had two namespaces, stingray and scale form. And we're going to do stingray dot level dot trigger underscore event. Now this is just the function to do this, right? So we could we could specify something else here. We could actually come up here and go local. Um, uh, let's see, trigger underscore event equals stingray dot level dot trigger dot event. We could do something like that, and then from that point forward, we didn't have to type this whole thing out. We could just type local trigger event uh, because this trigger event would then store a reference to that function. But I'm just going to go ahead and keep it the way it is here. And then once we've done that, we need to give it its arguments. And in this case, we need a reference to our level. And this will give us the level that has the flow node in it that's currently loaded. And the name of the event, which is explosion. All right, so that should be all we need to fire off our explosion event here. So let's give her a shot. You can ignore all those little error messages. It has to do with what I'm typing. And boom, there we go. There's our event being triggered. Uh, you may have may not have seen it, so I'm going to fire it one more time. Watch the top left of the viewport. Boom, there you go. All right, so we've triggered an event from le uh, that's in level flow using Lua script. All right, so very simple to do. And uh, we could also do the same thing to units. So if we had a unit that had some external event input, we could also trigger events inside of a unit as well instead of just inside of a level. All right, so now let's go ahead and move on to setting and getting flow variables uh, inside of Lua. Now before we actually write the Lua code, let's go ahead and have a look at level flow again. And let's go ahead and set this up so that we can uh, get it working inside of flow. So I'm just going to move these around a little bit. Actually, I'm going to put this one at the top. And we'll go ahead and group this. There we go. And we'll just call this one group number one trigger from Lua. All right, and we'll move that off to the side. OK, so let's go ahead and create a new group where we set up our flow variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a variable in flow that we can modify from Lua and then we can communicate back and forth, basically. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this variable once we load our level. So we're going to go event level loaded. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set a new variable. It's going to be a string variable, and that's going to be found at the bottom under variable, set string variable. All right, and we're going to call this string, or we're going to say its current value is not set. All right, and don't have to necessarily specify that, but I just like to. All right, and the variable itself will be called my flow var. Now, notice that I'm, the way I'm typing this is all lowercase, no spaces. Uh, it's going to be better for you. You're, you're not going to run into any problems if you do it in this format. Uh, avoid using capitalization or spaces. If you need spaces, use underscores. Uh, my, me personally, I like to do camel case, um, but I'll, when it comes to doing flow variables that are going to interact with Lua, uh, it seems to work best if you use all lowercase, at least in, in my test cases. All right, so that's just setting up our string variable, my flow var. All right, so it now it exists. That's basically all that is happening now. Okay, so now we want to set it up so that we can actually um, print that variable to the screen when we press a keyboard button. So print to screen is going to be under debug, print to screen. And we're going to do that when we press a keyboard button. So that would be input, keyboard button. And let's make it um, on pressed and we'll do the button name. Let's just K. I don't know. K because, because K. All right. Uh, and all we need to do now is print 
the actual variable. So we'll go get string variable instead of set string variable. And the name of our variable, if you recall, was my flow var. Okay. And by the way, you can change the scope here from local to global. But I'll just go ahead and leave that local, uh, meaning it's basically local to our flow. Uh, all right. And let's go ahead and put a label here. And we'll just say my flow var equals. Good, good, good. Uh, all right, let's just make sure we're still streaming here. All right, seems like we're still streaming good, and uh, we'll just continue on with our little lesson here. Okay, so our variable is now set up. We're ready to go. We're ready to start communicating with it from Lua. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, group this guy as well. We'll call this group number two, flow variable setup. All right, so I mean, I'm setting up a variable here. Um, all you really needed was, you know, set string variable. Honestly, that's really all you needed. Connect it to level loaded or, or whatever event you wanted to connect it to. All this other stuff is just so we can print it out and see what it, see what the value of the variable is. All right, so next up, we're going to actually set and get the variable from Lua, and that's going to require some flow uh, nodes here as well. So first up. Uh, rather than on level loaded, we're going to go ahead and get rid of this level loaded node here. We're going to call our function from Lua, so our project call from flow uh, Lua function. We're going to call that again on a keyboard press. So we'll do on the end value here, input, and then the keyboard button. And in this case, let's do L because L is next to K and L is cool. L is for like, I guess, whatever. L. Okay, and uh, once we do that, we're going to, basically we need to do a couple of things here. So when we call the function, uh, we need to, first of all, we need to use the function to set the value of our flow variable from Lua. And after we set that value, we want to print to screen the current value of flow var, my flow var, because we're going to change it. So it's going to say one thing at first, and it's going to say another thing once we change it. So let's use a sequence to do that. So I'm going to go into flow control and then sequence. And for the first step, we're going to set our string variable. So we'll do that variable set string variable. And uh, in this case, we're going to leave string blank because we're going to actually tie it in to Lua. Again, we need our name. That's my flow var. I could use the same um, set string variable here, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and create it, keep it separate so it's nice and clean. Uh, keep it local, all right, and so we want the string to be set based on Lua. So in that case, we need to do an external input this time. So we'll go to external input, external input string. All right, and the name of that, so we're going to give this external input a name. We're going to call it my uh, flow var in. Again, all lowercase uh, no spaces. You could use underscore here. Um, now, we're doing kind of a special thing here. I don't need to tie this to a variable. I don't need to do this. I could just use this. I could bring it in just like this and use it somewhere else. I could print this out to the screen directly. Uh, but in this case, I'm basically imagining a scenario where I might want to keep the data that I get from Lua as a permanent variable inside of my flow that I could use and modify and reuse and then maybe even send back to Lua. Okay, so, all right, so the other thing I wanna do is I want to also get this string in Lua. Okay, so anytime this string is set, I want to also get it. And I want to get the value that it's currently set at. Uh, so in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new external. We're gonna do external output string. So external output string is found here. And we're going to just go right out of the input into here. And we're going to call this ex external output. We're going to call it my flow var out. Okay. Uh, and last of all, oops, last of all, we need to actually print the value of the string on the screen. So we'll go ahead and do uh, debug again. So print the screen. And we'll give it a label here. We'll just do my same thing we did before, my flow var equals. All right, and then this will be sequence out number two. 
Now what we need to do is get the current value of our variable. So we'll do get string variable. And we'll tie that into the text field here. The variable will be, again, my flow var. All right, because that's our flow variable. Again, I could have tied it straight to this. I could have tied it to external input string and just printed that out. But I'm keeping it in a variable in case I want to reuse it. So that's why I'm doing this. Okay, so that should be our flow setup to uh, manipulate this flow variable from Lua. So let's go ahead and group it. And we'll call this group number three. And that should be our last group. So we'll go set and get flow var from Lua. All right, now we have to do the actual Lua code. So let's jump over to our script editor, bring my notes back up. Okay, so we're gonna go down to our uh, project call from flow. Okay, and remember we have our comments here for all the code we're gonna type in. And it's not a lot of code, but uh, we just commented it ahead of time so we knew what we were gonna type. First of all, we're gonna go ahead and do print, and we're gonna print my var, because we're gonna have a custom var here that we're gonna print out. Uh, now, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna set the value of our flow variable from Lua here. So to do that, we're gonna call stingray.level.set flow variable, okay? And uh, again, we could have made a shortcut version of this up above, but uh, we're just gonna use the full path to these functions for now. All right, so you can see here from the code hinting, we need to know uh, the level that we're gonna call the flow variable in the name of the variable and the value we're gonna pass it. So in this case, we already have a reference to our level. So we're gonna type level. Uh, and then we're gonna type uh, in quotes, my flow var in. So we're not actually passing the value directly to that flow variable, my flow var. Remember, we're passing it to the external input called my flow var in. And then we're, t we're sending it from that over to the my flow var. All right, and then the value we're going to pass is just testing one, two, three. Okay, now once we've passed it, we want to get that value. So let's create a local variable here, my var. That's what we're going to print out. And we're going to do again stingray.level.flow variable. So this is the same as, it, I guess it could probably be called get flow variable, would be, probably be more, a little more intuitive, but that's basically what this function does flow variable. Again, we need to pass the level, a reference to it, and then the name of the func the name of the external um, output event inside of flow. So that would be my flow var out. Okay. All right. So I believe that's all we need. And let's go ahead and do a quick test to find out if we're on the money. Okay, so obviously our event triggered, boom, at the top. And then if we look uh, down here, uh, let's see, it looks like we forgot something because I don't see anything. Or was it print to screen? Oh, gosh, it was print to screen and I had to press a keyboard. My bad. Uh, let's go back and we'll try that again. Let's press K. There we go. My flow of R equals not set when I press the K key. If I keep pressing K, it keeps saying that. But once I press L, there we go. It says my flow var equals testing one, two, three. And that's the value that we're getting from Lua. That was not done in flow. So we can see here, uh, we've changed the value. We've gotten a value from flow inside of Lua. And we've modified that value and passed it back. Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. So awesome. We're moving right along here. So again, we've got basically our setup here inside of flow, just to, to clarify how we've done this. Uh, triggering an event is very easy. Also, changing variables, passing variables back and forth, very easy. The thing you have to do is use the external events and the external input and output. And those are all found under the external category, all right? So you have your external input events, uh, or not input events, but your external input. So you can input actors, booleans, cameras, uh, IDs, lights, movers, numerics, quaternions, strings, units, and vector threes. Uh, output, same thing, except in this case, these are values that will be going out to Lua instead of values that are coming in from Lua. And then, of course, our in event, that is for triggering our events. So if we trigger something from Lua, this is how it gets intercepted by name. Uh, all right, so uh, very straightforward. 
And then, of course, our script, again, also very straightforward. We just have really three, three basic lines of code here. We have our trigger event code. Here we go, trigger event code. Now, of course, you need to have a reference to the level, so that makes it just a little more complicated to write, but there you go, there's your triggering code. And then, of course, your code to set a variable in Lua and your code to get a variable from Lua. And we could have even written this so that before we set it, we get the variable and then uh, the variable is already something in Lua or in flow. So maybe it was just the word testing. We could get that, concatenate the numbers one, two, three onto it, and then pass that back to, Lua, uh, to flow from Lua. So we can easily do modifications and stuff. Okay, uh, awesome. So that covers communicating with Lua and flow uh, pretty thoroughly, I think. Uh, again, very simple examples. You're going to want to do, obviously, much more complicated stuff there, but um, I think, you you know, based on this, you're well-armed to be able to do just about anything uh, as far as communicating back and forth with Lua and Flow. The question arises, of course, is when do you want to do uh, Lua and when do you want to do Flow? Uh, now, generally, Lua is going to be faster than Flow, again, because of the, the JIT that it uses. It compiles everything to C code. Uh, and uh, flow, however, is, is still considerably fast. It's still pretty fast, but flow is good for initialization of things, setting things up. You could theoretically build an entire game with flow, um, but generally uh, you're going to want to do... Uh, hold on a second. I think I may have stopped streaming. Let's... Uh check my my stream here oh no I'm still streaming I just have multiple versions of my streaming software running sorry about that guys I looked over to my streaming window and it didn't exist and uh, I was a little bit concerned that uh, I had lost you guys but no I'm still live awesome so uh, as I was saying um, basically you're gonna want to do um, Lua mostly for initializing your 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 assets your units your levels setting them up to work in certain ways. Some things are going to work really well in flow. Some things are going to be really complicated to do, such as when you're doing uh, any kind of conditional type statements. If you're doing ifs and elses and loops and things like that and, and testing conditions, that's better done in Lua uh, because otherwise your, your flow could get really massive and really complicated and really hard for someone else to follow. So generally you want to stick to your core game code, how everything moves around and works and tests things like collision and all that. Um, generally, you'd want to do stuff like that from Lua. But you certainly could do everything in Flow if you really wanted to. You could build a full game there. Uh, just bear in mind, it's going to get really messy. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's Lua and Flow. Let's talk about Lua and C++ now, uh, which is a little more complicated, but not as bad as you might think. So let's... Uh, I'm going to pull up um, a few things here. First of all, let's talk a little bit about Lua JIT. Um, let's see. Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, let's talk about Lua JIT before we actually talk about doing C++ with Lua. So, okay, Lua JIT. Lua JIT is, again, as I said earlier, it's a faster version of Lua because it compiles everything at runtime into C code. And you can get Lua JIT at luajit.org. Okay, and if you want to do any kind of C++ or C development, creating a DLL or dynamic link library that works with your Lua code in Stingray, you're going to need Lua JIT. You're going to have to download it and you're going to have to compile it. And it's uh, easier than you might think. Um, now currently, so if we go to the Lua JIT download, and this is a great website, by the way, with all kinds of information on how, how Lua JIT works, kind of performance comparisons, uh, how to use uh, Lua JIT, how to compile Lua JIT. Um, so, if you go to the download link here, currently in 1.1, the version of Stingray that I'm using, they use LuaJIT 2.0.0. Okay, now LuaJIT's up to 2.04, uh, and I'm not sure which version of Lua that LuaJIT 2.04 is compiled against. It might be 5.14, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but right now, Stingray is using LuaJIT 2.0.0 in 1.1. That will probably change in future releases. I can't say for sure. Uh, but I have heard from the dev team that they, you know, there may be uh, uh, updates on which version of LuaJIT they're using. But for now, if you're using 1.1, download LuaJIT 2.0.0. Uh, download it here, the zip file, uh, 926K. Download that bad boy right there. Um, and uh, so 
the way you use LuaJIT once you compile it in your is uh, there's a couple of ways that you can basically call C++ or C code from Lua. You can do um, the standard way of binding C++ uh, in Lua, or you can use what's called the FFI library extensions to LuaJIT. So if you look under extensions, we see this FFI library. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to call your C functions or C, C++ functions from Lua here. Here's an example of the code. I'm not going to go into detail on FFI. It's technically an easier way to use LuaJIT, so you might want to definitely read this post and investigate how to set it up. Um, but I'm going to show you the, the more complicated way, so to speak, of using LuaJIT today. Um, because I feel like it, it warrants a little more of an explanation than using FFI. Um, okay, so you downloaded LuaJIT to your computer and um, you want to compile it. So the easiest way to compile LuaJIT, so let's say I've got my LuaJIT, let's go over to my program file or my C drive here. I've put LuaJIT right here in this LuaJIT 200 folder and this is, this is how it will come. Uh, you've got your source folder here. This is all the C files for LuaJIT to work, uh, C files, the C and the, the header files. All right. Now, in order to compile LuaJIT, there are several ways to do it. Uh, LuaJIT.org provides instructions for all of the ways that it recommends. Uh, the way I chose to use, the way I think is the easiest, is using the Windows SDK. So if you download Microsoft Windows 7 SDK, not 8, uh, because the, the program you need to do the compiling is not ex does not exist in Windows SDK 8 anymore, Windows SDK 7 will give you what's called a, a command prompt, a Windows SDK command prompt. So let's go ahead and launch that. And uh, if you, if I were to do a search for that in Windows 7, I would just type Windows, or I'm in Windows 8, sorry, Windows SDK 7.1 command prompt. All right, so that's what we want. Uh, and basically, um, once we have that command prompt up, there's just a couple of things we need to do com to compile um, our program. First of all, we need to set to 64-bit. And that's because uh, Lua JIT and Lua inside of Stingray uh, are all 64-bit, and you want to compile against 64-bit. So we'll just go to uh, our command prompt window and type sla slash, or not slash, but set env slash release. We're building a release version of our Lua JIT x64. And oh, maybe I didn't need to slash set env slash release slash x64. Uh, what am I typing wrong here? Set env release x64. Am I in the right command prompt? It looks like it. Let's jump over to the actual instructions here. <laughs> Double check I'm not uh, doing something wrong here. I could have swore I had it right. Oh, I didn't put spaces. Duh. <laughs> My bad. All right, so again, let's try that. Set env slash release space slash release space slash x64. There we go. So the screen, the, the text turns green, lets us know we're in release and we're in x64. So you can see from the instructions here the next steps basically. Uh, the next step is simply to go to our source directory. So we need to go to the uh, root here and we'll do cd, uh, let's see, it was lua jit and then cd source. All right, so we're in the lua jit source directory now and all we have to do is type uh, msvc build. And there we go. So LuaJIT will be compiled, uh, release build 64-bit. Uh, it's turning away here. I don't remember how long this takes, probably not a long time, uh, but rather than waiting for the compile, I'm going to show you what I did next. Uh, actually, it's finished. Boom. All right. So it doesn't take very long at all. It's a very, very small program, actually. Uh, it's very. Uh, if you read all these docs on LuaJIT, it's a very high-performant program, very small, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, all right, so once you do the compile with uh, the SDK tool here, you'll find the file here, luajit.exe, and you can run that. And this is a standalone interpreter for luajit. So anything I do in here, hello Jupiter, there you go, Prince Hello Jupiter, all right. Uh, so, and that is using, com, you know, just in time compilation of everything I do. We also have our DLL, lua51.dll. And we have a lib file, lua51.lib. Uh, and so the next step, once you've done that, is to copy those into, so I've got a lua folder here, and I've created a folder here called JIT200 WinSDK64Bit. You don't, you don't have to call it this, this is just what I called it. 
And inside of this folder, I have copied the DLL, the lib file, the executable file. Don't really need that, um, but I did. Uh, and these are just some extra files that have nothing to do with what we're talking about, so ignore those. But these three files, the DLL, the lib, and the exe file. And then you create a Lua folder within this, and in another one called JIT within that. And you copy all of the files from the original source directory. So if we go back over to uh, Lua JIT, source, JIT, copy all these files into that location on your, your build. All right. And this is where we're going to, this, this location is where we're going to tell C++ uh, Visual Studio, in, in this case, to find the libraries and whatnot to link against. All right, so you could technically use something like Eclipse uh, to do your compiling, or there's a bunch of other Dev C++ or some of those other programs out there for compiling. Uh, but you know what? Microsoft Visual Studio community is completely free and unlimited um, for small projects and um, small teams and one-man shops, and that's what I use for testing. Uh, so that's what I'm going to launch right now. Uh, okay. So here we are in Microsoft Visual Studio Community, and uh, I've already created my Stingray DLL project. And what I need to do now is basically create the files, the the class file that we want to execute. Um, okay, so if you don't if you don't know C++ or C, if you're not familiar with it, if you're not comfortable with it, this part may be a little bit uh, hazy to you. It might cause your eyes to cross. Uh, don't worry about it. I'm going to kind of try to walk you through and explain at least in a nutshell kind of what each function I create is doing. And then we'll go over to Lua and we'll we'll do all the magic there and uh, that'll be it. I just want to show you how you would go about uh, setting up this whole process. All right, so before we write our code, we need to go ahead and tell our, our project, our C++ project, where to find the libraries and, and stuff. Now, uh, bear in mind that with Lua, uh, it's going to be expecting C code, not C++. Um, so we can write C code or we can write C++ code and there's a little trick to basically turning our C++ code into C code uh, that I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that's really the right way of explaining it. We're not, I don't know if we're really turning the C++ code into C code, but it, it is a little way of um, allowing Lua to read the, our code as if it were C code. So, all right, so let's right click here on our project and go to properties. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not a real programmer. So uh, that's why I, sometimes I fumble with the terminology there. <laughs> okay, so first up, uh, we've got our linker here and we want to, and where's my C++? Uh, that's a good question. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and create our file first. So let's do uh, maybe file new and then file. Um, and what we want is a C++ file. There we go. And we'll call this C++ file. Um, where is it at? Where did it put it? Uh, I don't see it. Let's try this again. Uh, add new class. There we go. Uh, C++ class. And we'll call this class... Um, There we go. Class name, we're going to call this class, um, oh, I don't know, my Stingray DLL. Let's call it that. Okay. And that'll create our class file for us and our header file for us. And there we go. All right. So again, not a real programmer, but uh, I have a basic idea what I'm doing. Uh, okay. So we've got our class here. I'm going to just delete everything in here. All right for now because we don't really need any of that and it will jump back over to our project properties hopefully this works now yeah okay now my C++ is located so because I didn't have my actual C++ file there already it didn't have the option of making changes okay that being said we'll jump over here to C and C++ in our properties and what we need to do is we need to add the include directories so what we want to include is we want to include that Lua JIT source code so we'll just select this and choose edit and it will add that source code directory in. I'm just going to browse to it. So it's going to be under luajit200 slash source. Okay and um, yeah that should be what we need there. Okay so that points to all our source files when we start including the Lua headers and whatnot. Now we need to go to our linker pro options here and under general 
we need to include uh, additional library directories. We need to uh, load in those lua.lib files. And for that, we'll just go ahead and edit that again. We'll browse to, um, in this case, we're going to browse to our built lua lib, which is here in this folder that I created. And um, that should be it. Select that folder. Okay, so that's the directory to find the library files in. And then finally, we need um, our, uh, let's see, that would be under uh, additional dependencies. So we've got, uh, we've got our additional library directories. Where's our dependencies under, here we go, under input. Additional dependencies and edit. So under additional dependencies, we're going to tell it the actual lib file that we want loaded. So this is called lua51.lib. And that is the lib file that, that is in that directory there. So say we lua51.lib. Okay. And that should be it. We should be set up. And now we can begin to type our C code. All right. So the first thing we need to do in order to take advantage of lua JIT is to include it in our C code. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to call any of the functions that are available in C uh, from Lua. Uh, now, normally to do that, you just simply type um, include, so pound, sharp, a hashtag, pound, whatever you want to call it, include, uh, and then the header file that we want. Now, you could type Lua.h here, and that would just give you the, the basic Lua files. Uh, in that case, you also need Lua JIT. Okay, but rather than typing each one of these out individually, we can just type lua.hpp. Okay, and the reason why we can do that is because inside of lua hpp, let's see if we can find it here. Here we go. So this lua header file, it includes all of the lua headers that we need. So we've got lua.h, the aux library for lua, the uh, regular library, and then the JIT code okay so that's everything we need and on top of that I told you that Lua expects C code not C++ otherwise you might have some issues compiling uh, at least I do generally so what you can do here is you can basically encase these inside of an extern C block so we have this block here and then just the keyword extern and the letter capital C in quotes uh, basically makes this uh, compilable as C code uh, alright so let's jump back over to our DLL all right, so we're going to do that same thing here in our in our actual DLL file. So we're going to basically do extern C, okay, and we're going to put our curly braces there, and now we can begin to create uh, some of our functions and stuff. So first up, uh, we're going to go just create a static variable. Uh, we'll do an integer here. And again, just like in Lua, I'm not my goal here is not to teach you C or C++. Uh, it's just to kind of explain how this all works with Lua and Stingray. So we'll just do this uh, little value here. I don't know that we're going to use it, but there's just an example of creating a, a variable in C++, uh, C++ and we'll just initialize it with the integer 1337. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our first function that we're going to call from Lua. We're going to call into uh, C uh, to get this number, and C will push it back to us. So static integer dll under this is the name of our function dll underscore return some val okay and the lua state is the first uh, argument we expect the lua state is basically um, going to pass us the the lua stack where we can push and pop variables to and from uh, and allow us to uh, do our magic with lua okay and then we'll just call that lua state l and we'll give us our open and close brackets and in here we're just going to use the first Lua command available in C Lua underscore push number so we're pushing a number onto the stack and Lua executes the stack in last in first out order and we're pushing this number onto the very top of that stack uh, and then we've got uh, our state L and then our value fun val so here we're just literally going to send that 1337 value to Lua when this function gets called and there's our return statement returning uh, one. Okay. All right, so our next function will be to actually run a Lua script based on its location, its actual physical location. So to run a Lua script from C, we can do static integer, DLL 
uh, we'll call this run Lua script and then uh, again our Lua state a pointer to that state and then inside of our function block we're just going to do another Lua command here called Lua L Lua L always comes from the Lua ox library Lua L underscore do file do file is a regular Lua command if I were to load up the Lua JIT uh, interpreter right now I could do do file and I could give it as a parameter the location the path to that file and it would execute that that Lua code so our first parameter again is this is the state pointer and then we're gonna specify the entire path here uh, in this case and I'm gonna use backspace backslash backslash because what we're doing is we're, we're in order to have a regular backslash we need to use the escape character backslash to have our backslash current work so location here, Stingray, projects, slash, slash, intro to Lua, backslash, backslash, intro to Lua. This is just a location on my hard drive. Script, Lua, hello, world, dot, Lua. Okay, so that's our script. We'll put a semicolon here. I've got to remember, I'm used to coding in Lua where you don't need semicolons at the end of your lines, and you do need them at the end of your C++. Return zero. Okay, now this file doesn't exist yet, so let's go ahead and jump back over to Stingray and create our Hello World Lua file. So we'll just do a new file here, and for Hello World Lua, uh, let's just make it real simple. Print Hello World. I was called from C++, whatever. Uh, yeah, so real simple. And we'll save that under script, Lua. And again, hello world is our file name. And we're done. All right, so let's go back over to C++. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do next? So, all right, so a couple more things here. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually show you how a table can be created inside of C++ from Lua. Now a lot of these examples and stuff basically come from the Lua docs and the Lua books. So uh, you know if you really want to get a more in-depth understanding of how this all works, just pick up the book that I told you about programming in Lua or uh, you know go to lua.org and you'll be able to find examples of how to do this stuff with more explanation. Alright so to create a table in Lua we're going to go ahead and create a new function static integer, we'll call this one DLL Create new table. And again, we get our Lua state. Okay, now in here we're going to use uh, three different Lua functions. We're going to create a table, well, um, three or four. First of all, we're going to create our table. Then we're going to push some numbers to that table, to the top of it. Uh, then we're going to set the table and we're gonna push another number or two, maybe a string, um, and then that's, that should, do, should be it. So two or uh, three or four different functions here. So here we go. Uh, and these are all Lua functions, again, that you can look up on lua.org. So Lua create table. So we're creating a data table to hold our variables in. Uh, and uh, we'll call this, uh, we gotta get our Lua state, and then we'll um, two and zero. So we've created our table. Uh, and then we're going to push a number to the table. So Lua push number, our state, Lua state, and then we're just going to push the number um, um, there, just like that. Uh, okay, and that is, by the way, that's not the number we're pushing, that's um, the index one. So um, there we go, the key, I should say. Lua push number and then again our state, and then we'll push the number 42. So that's the actual value. So the first one here is pushing the key, so our key will be 1, and then the second one here is pushing our value. Our value will be 42. So one key 1 is equal to 42. That makes sense, I hope. Uh, that shouldn't be indented. All right, so now we're going to set our table. Set table negative 3, and that basically puts it um, back to the top from where it was and we'll do another push push number our key again will be 2 this time okay and then Lua push in this case we're gonna push a string 
and uh, again our state and the string will be stingray is awesome how about that okay hopefully I don't have any typos here let's push number looks like I might have a few there you go push number set table push number push string all right good 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 and in last of all put my semicolon I'm missing another semicolon too I'll fix that in a minute set table negative three all right all right, so we've created a table here in C, a Lua table. Now, here's the, 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 the trick. Here's the cool thing. So remember, Lua has a garbage collector. C++ does not. So the way you should handle that with Lua and C++ is not to create custom values necessarily in C++, like a Lua var, um, and then figure out how to pass that data back and forth based on garbage collection and whatnot. But instead of doing that, Lua uses a stack, and that stack is shareable with C++. Or C. Um, and so what is happening is even though we've created this table in C, this table will be accessible in your Lua code as well. And we can print out the values, we can modify the table uh, and whatnot. So uh, even though we've created it here in C, Lua can access it. And we'll do some stuff with it here in a little bit. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and do something right now. Let's basically set this as a global variable in Lua. So we'll do Lua underscore set global there's our Lua state and we're gonna call this global variable DLL args this will be the actual variable name we can use in Lua to access this table all right and get all of our semicolons taken care of uh, all right last of all we'll do our return return zero okay um, So now that we have our table, let's say we want to parse it from Lua, but using C. So we'll go ahead and set up a parse function to parse the table. And we'll just do another static integer dll underscore parse table. Okay, and then we need our Lua state as usual. Okay, and all we're going to do here is uh, get the global. So in other words, let's say we have gone into Lua and we've made some changes to our DLL args global table now we want to make some make take those changes that um, we did in Lua and get those values again so we can simply do that here with parse table um, Lua underscore get global pass the state and then pass the name of our table Lua uh, DLL args there we go And this will start to make a little more sense when we get into the actual Lewis side of things. All right, and we'll return true this time. Okay, uh, let's see. Last of all, we need to actually register all of these functions with Lua so the Lua VM knows uh, basically how to call them. All right, so to do that, we'll create our last fairly important function here. This will be of integer type, and uh, it will be declare spec dll export. All right, and we're going to do Lua open, this is the name of our function, Lua open C functions. And we need to pass the Lua state. All right, so from here, now remember, this is, this is the more complicated way of binding your C functions, um, your Lua to Lua. And uh, using FFI is a lot easier. So you might want to do that instead. But like I said, I wanted to show this one because it, it had a little more setup involved. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the Lua call, Lua register. So Lua underscore register. And it expects the state, the Lua state. And we're going to give it the name of the function that we can call from Lua. So we're just going to use the exact same names here. So I'm going to call it DLL underscore return some val. And then we pass the actual function return some val. So the this name here that I can call from Lua will be bound to this C function here. All right. And we just have to do the same thing for all the other functions. So DLL underscore uh, create new table. OK. Uh, next was uh, run Lua script. I just know I'm going to have some typos here. We'll work through it. DLL underscore run Lua script. 
Okay, um, one more. Lua register dll underscore pars table. And we'll do return false. Uh, okay, so that should be it. That's our C file. This is our full on DLL with everything we need. Uh, let's just look through it real quick again and just walk through some of these things just so we know again. So including Lua.hpp is basically including all of the Lua header files, including Lua JIT, and they're all enclosed within an external C uh, so that it basically compiles a C code. Um, and then we have our actual block of code here, our functions. And again, we've put them within an external C so that it also compiles a C code. We've got our first variable here. We've got a function here. Uh, that is going to pass that variable to Lua. We've got a function here that will run a Lua script. We've got a function here that creates a Lua table and sets it as a global variable that can be accessed. We have a function here that can parse that table and return the value. And then we have our register functions of binding the actual C++ functions to function names that we can call from Lua. All right, um, let's try to compile it. <laughs> This is the fun part. Uh, okay, so let's do a build, build solution. Oh, wow, look at that, no typos. Good job, Matt. All right, so we've succeeded in building our DLL. So the next step will be to put that DLL in a place that Stingray can find it and to write our Lua code. So let's go ahead and proceed with those steps. And uh, I think that'll be it for the day, guys. I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, okay, so the DLL has been compiled. We need to find it. And uh, if you know Visual Studio, basically, um, if we go into our actual location here, we can right click and do open file in uh, open folder in File Explorer on our project. And then if we jump into x64 release, we should have our DLL file here, and I'm looking, I'm looking. Um, maybe it's not here. Let me double check. Intro to Lua, intro to Lua, just uh, x64 release my stingray.dll. Am I not seeing it for some reason? Or I'm in the wrong folder, maybe? Oh, yeah. There we go. I was in the wrong folder. So uh, if you go up from my stingray DLL, there's x64 folder here, release. And there we go, there's the DLL, mystingray.dll. So what we need to do is we need to copy this DLL to our Stingray program files folder. So C, program files, at least while developing, we'll go into Autodesk, Stingray, 1.1, and then from here we're gonna go into Engine, Win64, Dev. All right, and then we would simply paste it right here. I have already got my stingray.dll file right there, ready to go. Uh, now, obviously, if you are going to release your game, you're going to ship your game, you're going to need to make sure that this DLL file is packaged in with um, your Stingray build. So um, this is just a temporary um, way of doing it. I'm just dropping it into the dev folder here so that it will be able to find it. Uh, otherwise, you could put it somewhere else. You would just have to make sure that your script uh, can find this DLL explicitly with a, an absolute path. Uh, but by putting it in here, your script should be able to find it, no problem. All right, so once we have done that, uh, we can simply go over back to Stingray and set up our Lua. So um, let's do that next. All right, so what do we need to do? We basically need to um, include our DLL. We need to be able to require it. We need to let our Lua project know where to find it. Uh, and then we can start calling functions from it. So what we're going to do here is, uh, there's a couple ways you could do this. We could load it in as a require, or we could load it in as uh, a library. And I'm going to do the load as library because you've already kind of seen the require, how that works. You can see here I specify require, uh, and then I could even make this a variable. I could say um, local my first class equals require, but um, I'm not going to do that today. Uh, instead of doing the require, I'm going to show you how to use it do using a load lib, uh, Lua's load lib function. So to do that, let's go ahead and create um, a custom function for our DLL. So we'll jump down to the bottom here. We're going to create this new function. We're going to call it function uh, project 
dot my dll okay and we'll just put our end there uh, now we're gonna call this my dll function we're gonna call it from the on level load preflow so right after all of this after we trigger this event let's do project dot dll uh, oop, my dll and uh, there we go so now we can call this function and in here before we can start operating with the DLL and doing all the functions that are in it, we need to load it. So to do that, we're going to specify the path to the file. Now remember, because I put it in the dev file under my Stingray program files directory, uh, it's going to be able to find it really easily. And it's so easy to find it by putting it there that all you have to do is type the name of the DLL. So my Stingray DLL dot DLL. Okay, uh, and that's it. Obviously, if you wanted to put it somewhere else, you're going to have to be a little more complicated there with the path. All right, so now that we have the path variable to uh, the DLL, we can go ahead and load it. So we'll do a local DLL init. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you call this. I'm just calling it DLL init equals assert. So assert is Lua's way of letting you know that something went wrong. We're going to basically put our load inside of the assert so it can tell us if why something went wrong if something went wrong. So we're going to use package.loadlib path. That's our path, just the DLL. And then uh, the function we want to call is Lua open C functions. Uh, okay. And then we can fire off DLL in it as if it were a function. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and run that real quick and let's make sure that we don't have any kinds of errors or anything when we do so. Uh, we shouldn't have. It should just be simply loading the DLL now and firing off the, the init uh, function, which, well, the init function loads the DLL. Okay, so I can just go ahead and launch it from here using the play button. And as you can see, the editor loads the viewport the playable viewport and we get no errors in the console so everything looks to be on the up and up so we've actually loaded our DLL into uh, be, uh, being accessible by Lua so let's actually try to use some of the functions that we created in the DLL now um, alright so let's start off with um, let's start off with return some value so remember return some value is going to return the number 1337 which is a C uh, variable, uh, or or at least it's the contents of our C variable. So to do that, we're just going to print it to the log console, and uh, we'll just say um, DLL value fetched from C plus plus comma, and then of course the function that we bound inside of C plus plus was return some val. Um, all right. Let's do that. Let's see what happens. Uh, we're going to be looking for the log console down here to basically spit this out. Let's clear the log console. Okay. I'm not sure why mine won't stay at the bottom. Um, but there you go. It worked. So we have called our first C++ function from C uh, from Lua. And we spit out the value 1337. Remember, that number is nowhere to be found in our Lua code. That is all coming from C++. As you remember, at the very top here, static integer fun val equals 1337. So, and that is our function, return some value. All it does is returns, uh, it pushes that number to the stack is what's happening. And it returns the value. So this number is on the Lua stack at the very top uh, at that point in time. And we're getting it and printing it out. Okay, so that one's easy enough. Let's try something else here. Um, next up, we can run the Lua script. That was easy. DLL underscore run Lua script. So this one should print out the word hello world. So let's go ahead and run our guy here. See if I can get my, my scroll bar to stay at the bottom this time. Nope, it doesn't want to stay at the bottom. Oh well. All right, now if we go all the way down, we're looking for the word hello world. There we go. Hello world, I was called from C++. So remember, this is the file that we created here in Lua. This is what it does. 
Hello World, I was called from C++. And in C++, if we jump back over there, our function here is all it's doing is it's using the Lua command do file to execute that Lua file for us. Don't know why you'd want to do that, uh, but you never know, and uh, it definitely could come in handy. Uh, all right, so let's jump back over to our project here, and let's do something else. Let's start working with the table. So now we're going to go ahead and create that table inside of C. The function exists, but the table's not actually being created because we haven't called the function. So here's what we'll do. We'll call, we'll create the table, um, and then we'll print the current contents of the table, um, and then maybe do some, some modifications. We'll set an element of the table and uh, basically parse the table using the parse function. So first of all, we just need to create the table. So if you recall, the function was called dll underscore create new table. All right, so once we have created the table, we can go ahead and print out all of that information because when we create the table, C++ is filling it with data and setting it as a global table or a global variable inside of Lua on the stack. So we'll do for i equals one. This is a basic for loop in Lua. We're gonna, our limit for our for loop will be the length of our table, DLL args. That little hashtag in front of it tells you the length of. And we're gonna do this for every element of our table. We're gonna print um, DLL DLL args. This is just arbitrary text. It's not important what you put here, but I'm going to concatenate with concatenate it with the integer or I'm sorry, the i value here, the element, uh, the number that we're on. Oh, bear in mind also, Lua is uh, does not start at zero when it does arrays and things like that. It tends to start at one, so just keep that in mind. Um, all right, we'll concatenate that with the equals. And then we'll pass the actual value uh, at that key. All right, and we can do end that. So let's just stop there before we do anything else, and let's see if uh, our little we create our, we can create our table and print out what's currently in it. Again, values that we're grabbing from C, um, which are being put onto the Lua stack actually from C. So let's print that out, or I should say, play our level. We don't get any compile errors, so, oh, yes we do. Okay, uh, let's see, attempt to call length of global DLL arg. Okay, well, I think I put the wrong name there. It should be DLL args, if I'm correct. Let's jump back over to C to double check. DLL args, that's right. Okay, my bad. So there was a compile error, we'll fix, we've got that fixed, and let's try again. There we go. Okay, so from our DLL args table, which was created in C, first value at key one is 42, second value at key two is Stingray is awesome. Perfect, everything's working. That's what I like to see. All right, so let's do a few more things and we'll be done. Let's go ahead and uh, set an element of our table that was created in C from Lua. So all we gotta do is go DLL args, we'll set key three, and we're gonna say anything is possible at Zombocom. I don't know if you've ever been to Zombocom. I don't even know if it still exists, but man, it is a great site. It's been around, gosh, I want to say over 10 years, the first time I saw it. Anyway, check it out, Zombocom. It's just a funny place. Uh, all right, I hope it still exists. So what we're doing is we're just going to set that element, and now we're going to parse the table. So we're going to create a new table, temp table, equals dll pars table. So we're, we don't really have to do this, okay? Remember, because the stack is shared between C++ and Lua. We could easily get the table's information from Lua without using a C++ function. But I'm just trying to show you an exa examples of calling back and forth between the two. That's the idea. All right, so we, we're using the C++ pars table function and we're gonna store what it gives us inside of temp table. So we'll do print dll dll args 3 equals temp table 3 all right now remember this is that we're getting this straight from c++ that's being passed to us back from c++ through the function but it's it's kind of weird the way it's doing it cuz it's really just sharing the stack uh, the the data on the stack 
Okay, so, and then we'll just clear our temp table once we're done with that because it is a temp table. We'll just set it to nil and that wipes it. It basically tells the garbage collector it can eliminate that from memory. Um, yeah, I think that's going to do it. Let's go ahead and test that out real quick. We'll clear our console. All right, and let's see our output. All right, so sure enough, DLL args 3 equals anything is possible. So as you recall, in our last step here, what we did is we s manually set the value of DLL args 3 to anything is possible at Zombo.com. Then we, we didn't need to do this. We could have just printed out that value now from Lua, but instead we went kind of the long way around and we used parse table from C++ and printed out, put that into a temporary table and printed that out instead. And if you recall, if we jump back over to C++, all parse table is really doing is it's getting the table. It's getting the original DLL args table, a reference to it, and passing it back, returning it to Lua. All right? Okay, so like I said, most of these examples are not necessarily something you do or would want to do. Uh, they're very simple, um, but they will give you an idea of how you can communicate back and forth between Lua and C++. Uh, using a DLL file. So again, it, it's one of those situations where, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, obviously, if you're doing things that need to be very efficient, very um, CPU expensive things, uh, you could say something like physics simulation or, um, gosh, I don't know, AI pathfinding maybe. Uh, not necessarily though. Um, bear in mind, most of those things are handled by Stingray already. Um, through things like navigation um, and NVIDIA physics and whatnot. But, you know, anything that's really intensive, anything that needs a lot of cycles on the CPU, you would do in C++ instead of Lua generally. But 99.9%, .9 I would say, maybe, uh, of your game code is going to be Lua, fine in Lua. Uh, most of your stuff, you're just, you're, you're not going to need to go into C++ for. Uh, but now you know how. Now you know how to create a DLL, access it from Lua, uh, talk back and forth, and uh, kind of how they work together. Uh, as well as, I hope, how to communicate back and forth with Flow in Lua. And hopefully today you, you got a better understanding of what Lua is and uh, um, the reasons why Stingray uses Lua and, and whatnot. Okay, so, wow, that was a good long session today. Um, I am going to be trying to stream on a regular basis this year. Um, probably once a week. I haven't nailed down a day yet. Uh, obviously, this is um, not a Friday. This is like a Monday. So normally I would stream on a Friday, but I'm going to be out of town for the rest of the week. I'm still on vacation technically from work. Uh, and I'm going to go out of town the week after that as well for work. So uh, I probably won't be back on for two weeks from today. But uh, once I do get back on, I'm going to try to give you guys some more uh run-throughs of how to use uh, different aspects of Stingray uh, as well as getting back into doing some mud box work and some character modeling and stuff with Maya and whatnot. So uh, I want to thank everybody that was able to come today and watch the show. Hopefully you learned something uh, about Lua and C++ and Stingray and all that jazz and uh, now hopefully you'll have a really good understanding of how to build your own games using these things. And uh, if you have any questions as always just shoot me a Twitter. Matthew Doyle Art is my Twitter. And uh, Matthew with two T's, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, D-O-Y-L-E, art. And I'll be happy to answer your questions on Twitter. Uh, otherwise, I have a blog uh, at my website, matthewdoyle.com, or on the area on Autodesk called Game On. And uh, you can post comments there on any posts I make or whatnot. So, uh, all right, that's it for me today. I'm ready to call it a day. My voice is starting to give out on me. That was a lot of talking and a lot of code to write at the same time. And I think it went really well. But otherwise, thanks for coming, guys, and we'll see you next time.